You can be seated. Our junior high students at this time, you're dismissed to follow Solomon. So follow Solo out for the junior high class. I want you to think back to the last invitation you received to any event. What was it? The last invitation that you got in the mail or via text? A baby shower. What else? Birthday party. Graduation parties. Reunion. What else do we get invited to? Weddings, right? Various religious events. I don't know, like Easter at Village Park. Oh my goodness. It's like, it's like I don't even know why I try. Right? We, we've been inviting you next week, right? And hopefully you've invited some friends to come and be a part uh, of Easter next week. But our, I remember when Leslie and I got married just over, uh, or just under, should, I should say, 19 years ago. And um, we sat down with her family and with my family and we had us a nice little spreadsheet that we had made on our typewriter because that's how old we are. You know, I'm kidding. It wasn't, we had Excel back then. And um, we sat down and we had all of our lists and I mean, it was just hundreds and hundreds of people. And, and, and I'm, not say, I'm not saying that we're extremely popular, but we are. You know, I just want you to know that. But anyway, just kidding. So we had all these names, and, and, but we knew our budget. And we knew how much it was going to cost to rent the facility, how much it was going to cost, you know, to have the flowers done and our tuxes and all that stuff. And I'm a budget guy, so we had a nice spreadsheet. And then I knew what it was going to cost per person to feed people at the reception. Now, Leslie's parents were, were taking care of that part of the, the wedding, but I was trying to be mindful of their budget and trying to be respectful of them. And, and so we sat down with our lists and we had to cut people. You feel the pain? We had to cut people, but when we finally came up with our list, there, there were people on the list that I didn't know. Because Leslie's dad, who was uh, funding this big shindig, had some friends at work that he wanted to invite and I wasn't going to tell him no so that my third cousin twice removed and five times divorced, you know, can come that has one tooth. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not going to make that argument, but you kind of sit down with your list and you make a decision. You say, who can we invite? When my kids want to have a birthday party, we tell them, okay, this is what we can do. And these are how many friends you can invite. And they have to take the list and figure out, okay, which friends are going to be included and which ones are going to be Excluded. That's just the way that invitations work. But you've probably received invitations to events, a birthday party, a wedding, or whatever. And receiving an invitation is very different than extending an invitation. When you are invited to something, that means that the other person has opened up their heart to you and they say, we want you to come. But when you extend the invitation, that's very different because now you're the one who says to someone else, we want you to come to this party. Does that make sense? So there's a difference between receiving an invitation and then extending an invitation. Last week, we started a series of messages called Come and See, and we studied the story of a man named Nathaniel who received a very simple invitation from his friend. And his friend said to him when he talked about Jesus in John chapter 1, he said, I want you to come and see. Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And, and the friend said to him, I want you to come and see in John chapter 1 and verse 46. So someone extended an invitation to, to Nathaniel and said, I want you to come and see Jesus. I want you to come and I want you to see who he is. So one person extended the invitation, but Nathaniel received it and he was invited to come and see Jesus. And if you were here last week, you saw that that one invitation, come and see, three words, changed his life forever. Because if you notice in John chapter 1 and verse 49, that Jesus supernaturally revealed himself to Nathanael and Nathanael called him, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. It changed his life forever. But in that story, Nathanael was invited to come and see Jesus. Today, we're going to study that same three-word invitation, but it's a completely different scenario. And we find this story in John chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, him being Jesus, saying, 
Lord, he whom you love is ill. In verse 3, we find an invitation. Mary and Martha send an invitation to Jesus. And that invitation is three words. It's Jesus, come and help. We need your help. On Friday night, we were helping a local school raise some money and selling some barbecue. And I had my phone and people had started coming up and we were starting to pass out the sandwiches. And all of a sudden, Leslie's phone was ringing or calling me. And, but Leslie was mit, with me and we had left Luke at home with the kids because Adam was sick on Friday. And so Leslie helped me set up and then she was going home and I got the call from Leslie's phone. I thought, okay, that's somebody at the house. And I tried to answer it, 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 it wouldn't answer. And so I, I went back and was trying to get to it. Well, then he called back and Luke was on the other end of the, the line and there was this desperation in his voice that I had not heard from Luke before and it freaked me out. And he said, Adam is having difficulty breathing. And then you talk about panic mode. I'm 15 minutes away. Leslie's 15 minutes away. And so I said, what do you mean he's not breathing? He's like, he's having trouble breathing. And, he's, and Luke is starting to panic. And I said, well, he said, well, I said, okay, listen, tell Noah, go down the street and get Miss Libby. That was our neighbor. Tell Miss Libby to come. All right, I'm going to call Miss Libby right now. So I'll call you right back. So I got off the phone. I pointed to Leslie, like, get home. And so I explained it to her. I called Libby. Say, Libby, you got to go down to my house. Adam's having trouble breathing. I don't know the severity of it, but if you could check with him, we got a nebulizer down there. We have uh, the inhaler. So Luke knows where all that is. And so I'm freaking out. People are like, I want a pulled pork sandwich. I don't care. My kid can't breathe, you know? And so I'm like, send Leslie home, right? And I'm like, I don't I don't care how much money the school is going to raise. My kid can't breathe. And so anyway, I send her home and, and then Libby comes down there and, and, uh, and what it ended up happening was Lou, uh, excuse me, Adam was watching the Pixar movie Coco. Now I've not seen that movie, but I've heard it's really sad. And they had watched it one time before and it really freaked Adam out about death. And so he knows he wasn't supposed to watch it, but he watched it anyway while we were gone and it freaked him out and he started doing that, you know, that kind of cry and that freaked Luke out and Luke thought he was having difficulty breathing and I called my neighbor Libby, she's like, yeah, he's just crying. And I'm like, okay, great, great, <laughs> great. You know, so glad there was such a major emergency that, you know, we're passing up sandwiches. You know, I'm like, okay, so anyway, all, all was well, but I'm telling you, that when I heard my son say, come and help, I'm like, we're on the way. And I don't care where I would have been, what I had in front of me, we're coming to help you because you answer that kind of cry for help. And that's their invitation to Jesus. Lazarus is sick and they call out to Jesus, they send word to him and they tell him, we want you to come and help. Now in those days, they didn't have Facebook hypochondriacs. You know, somebody, good morning, everybody. I sneezed this morning. Have a great day. <laughs> Unfollow. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, I, and then they take like a boomerang of them. Achoo, achoo, achoo. Unfollow. Y'all made fun of me because I hate those boomerang videos and I made one for the Camp Bake Sale just because I knew you'd think it was funny. But anyway, um, so in our culture today, we might call grandma and say, hey, I've got to work today. Will you come watch the kids because one of our kids is sick? But in Jesus' day, that's not the way things worked. You wouldn't send word to a friend in another town, no matter how far away it was. You wouldn't call them and say, hey, I need you to come because my son has strep throat. Or I need you to come because my son has a runny nose. When you would send word to someone, it was something really severe. Years ago, there was a, a friend of ours that uh, had a loved one that had gone into hospice care. And so, as you know, when a person is placed in hospice care, that means that their body is on the decline that the doctors have essentially said, there's just nothing else that we can do and we're gonna try to manage their pain. And so, uh, they had been placed in hospice care and had been in that care for quite some time. And, and I got a call that day from the family and they said, we'd like you to come. And what had happened was the nurse who was in care of, of the patient that morning had come there and basically knew the signs and told the family, the end is near. Like now's the time to call all of your family and friends together, those who would want to say goodbye for the last time. And they wanted me to come and be there in the room with them and pray with them and just be there with them. For Mary and Martha to send word to Jesus about their brother's sickness, this is not a cold, this is not strep throat, this is Jesus, we need you to come. 
Without some kind of divine intervention, our brother Lazarus is going to die. This is a call your family and friends kind of moment. And so Mary and Martha send word to Jesus and they ask him, we want you, Lord, to come and help us. Come and do something about what we're facing. And what they were inviting Jesus to, even in their minds, was an impossible situation. It's the doctor coming into the room and saying, you have stage four cancer, it has spread throughout your entire body and there is no treatment that we can give you. And it will just be a matter of time before you're going to die. I mean, that's the kind of news that they would have sent to Jesus. And when we think of Mary and Martha sending word to Jesus, we think, well, that makes sense because that's exactly what the Bible tells us we should do. That when we're in a desperate situation, when we are in a time of need, we should call out to God and ask him to help. In Psalm 50, in verse 15, the psalmist writes, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. So we should call on the Lord in our day of trouble. In Psalm 86, in verse 7, in the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. So Mary and Martha did exactly what Jesus tells us to do. He tells us to come to him and give our burdens to him. He tells us to come to him and ask him for help. But I want you to notice in verse 4, but when Jesus heard the news, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified to it. So through it, excuse me. And so when we receive verse 4, we think, okay, good. Because Jesus knows everything. So Mary and Martha are like me on Friday night. They think their, their loved one is dying. And Jesus, when he receives word from those friends that came to give the word to Jesus, he says, he's not dying. But God is going to be glorified through this situation. Because if Jesus knows everything, if he is truly God in the flesh, then Jesus knows what's gonna happen in this story, and Jesus would certainly never just ignore someone's cry for help. He would never hear us praying to him and asking him, God, we need you to intervene in this situation and not answer that cry, right? I mean, the psalmist said, call on me in the day of trouble, and I will answer. Call on me, and I will hear you, and I will be with you. Notice verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and so that's encouraging. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two two days longer in the place where he was. Now, hang on a second. I thought if we call out to God for help, God drops everything and comes running. But is that what happened in this story? They said, Jesus, come and help, and Jesus stays where he is for two days. And can you imagine Mary and Martha, they sent their friends out with the message for Jesus, and where they lived was only two miles from where Jesus was at the time? And so they probably waited that first day, like surely when the message got to Jesus, I mean, they did a 30 minute, 45 minute mile, maybe, you know, four or five hours, Jesus will be here and he's got to be coming along the horizon. He knows that Lazarus is sick and we wouldn't call upon Jesus unless our situation was desperate and we really needed him. So Jesus is coming, right? No, he's not. He didn't come. Well, wait, I thought Jesus is loving. Because if Jesus really loved them, why would Jesus remain where he was? Now I want you to, in your heart, try to answer that question. Because Jesus could heal Lazarus, right? He's he's God. So how do we in our minds reconcile that Jesus is all loving and all knowing, and yet, When he received word about a dear friend of his, that's what verse 5 said, that Jesus loved them. He didn't just like them. These were people that he truly loved in the depths of his soul. Why would Jesus remain where he was when someone in desperation had cried out to him for help? You see, one of the main arguments or one of the main problems that I hear from atheists when it comes to God is this. If God is good and God has the power over everything, and God had the power to heal Lazarus, 
or God had the power to heal my mother who got cancer, or in my case, my grandmother who died of ovarian cancer in 1984. If God is good, and if God is loving, then why does God allow suffering? Why didn't Jesus come? If there is a God who is good, why do people suffer? If they continue to suffer, that must mean that either Jesus is not as loving as he said he was, or he's not powerful enough to do something about it. And in that statement, he would no longer be God. Notice verse 7. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. So he tells his disciples, okay, now's the time to go into the region of Judea. And the next few verses, we'll kind of skip them for the sake of time. They pushed back because the last time Jesus were there, they were trying to kill him. And Jesus basically said, I've got work to do while it is day. And we have this work to do. I want you to go down to verse 11 and we'll pick up the story there. And after saying these things, he said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And I love verse 12. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. He's going to wake up. You're telling me like you're like a heavenly alarm clock? Lazarus is sleeping and we're just going to go wake him up? That's ridiculous. Why would we go to, into Judea where we were threatened the last time, put our lives on the line because your friend is oversleeping, right? It doesn't make sense, but they're missing the point because Jesus said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, excuse me, verse 13. Now, the Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. In verse 14, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus has died. And I want you to allow what he says in verse 15 to trouble you at your core. He says, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there. Are you kidding me? You're glad that you weren't there when Jesus, you had the power to heal him? How can you make that kind of statement? And the last part of the verse gives us an indication so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Verse verse 15, excuse me, is so striking to me. I am glad for your sake that I wasn't there and that Lazarus has died. Because that seems so contrary to everything that we want to believe about Jesus and even that Jesus said about himself, that he is always good, that he will never do us harm. If that is true, then why would Jesus not go to Lazarus? And then why would he make the statement, I'm glad that I wasn't there? God allows suffering in this world. And that is a reality that all of us need to come to grips with. That God allows suffering in the world. And all suffering, whether it's sickness or it's depression or it's broken marriages, whatever the suffering is in our lives, God allows those things to happen, but the reason that they happen is because sin has wreaked havoc in the world. Sin has wrecked all of creation, so every moment of suffering in your life, it's because of sin's effect on the world. And God allows us to suffer. Jesus did not immediately come. But I do not want you to misunderstand what Jesus said in verse 15. Jesus did not say, I'm glad that you suffered. He didn't say, I take joy in the death of Lazarus. Or I take joy or some kind of gladness because Mary and Martha suffering. He did not say that he was glad that they suffered. He said, I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there because Jesus had something even greater in mind. And we're going to discover that. At the end of verse 15, he said, so that you may believe. 
I want you to know what God is always doing in this world. You need to hear this. God is always trying to draw people to himself. He is always trying to bring people into a relationship with himself. And sometimes God allows suffering in my life and in your life to bring us to him so that we might believe deeper, but to draw other people to himself so that they may believe that God is good even in spite of the suffering that they have endured. The story continues in verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Go down to verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatsoever you ask from God, God will give you. Lazarus has been dead for four days. Four days to wonder, Jesus, why didn't you come? Why didn't you answer my prayer? I said it and sent the message to you with all sincerity that Lazarus was sick and you got that message. So why didn't you come? Jesus, Lord, why didn't you come? Four days he had been dead, four days of wondering and four days of confusion because Martha said to him, Lord, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. How many days has it been for you? Lord, if you had been here, I wouldn't have been in that bad relationship for so long. Lord, if you had been here, my marriage wouldn't have fallen apart. Lord, if you had been here, my friend wouldn't have suffered. Lord, if you had been here, I wouldn't be battling depression. Lord, if you had been here, my marriage could have been saved. Lord, if you had been here, I could have overcome this addiction by now. Lord, where were you? A few years ago, I was participating uh, as a bystander in a 5K. Didn't want anybody to be confused on that. It's called Run for Hope, and it's a 5K that my sister and brother-in-law put together to raise money for adoptive families. And there was a pastor that got up before the race began, all the runners were at the, the start line, and he shared the story. This was before we had made a decision to adopt. And he began to share the story of his own adoption. They had adopted a daughter from China as well. And after they had adopted her, this little girl, the dad was sharing the story with all these hundreds of runners that this girl had a really difficult time attaching to her family. They adopted her a little bit later in life and so she had been an orphan for quite some time and the longer a kid is orphaned like that, uh, the more difficult it is for them to form relationships of trust. That's why a lot of kids who are in the foster care system suffer so tremendously because they can't trust people. And that's why many of them, when they get out of uh, the fault, when they foster out, many of them end up homeless. Many of them end up committing suicide because it's very difficult for them to trust someone. And this man was sharing the story about when he got his daughter home and he really had a, a wrestling match trying to get this girl to attach to him. And, and uh, through the course of a lot of conversations, they found out that at the orphanage, this girl had not been treated very well, that she had basically slept on the floor, but just a piece of plywood, very hard beds. And that was kind of her living conditions. And one night she was laying down on her bed and she said, you know, daddy, this, this bed is so soft. And then she said, why did it take you so long to come? And man, standing at that 5K, I was standing behind him and I think I was supposed to say the prayer after that. I mean, I got choked up about this little girl in that orphanage all those years wondering is this what it's going to be? And to ask the question, Daddy, why did it take you so long to come get me? And he told her, he said, baby, I tried to come as fast as I could. And you can understand the despair that that little girl may have felt in that orphanage. And then to find out that there was someone that could have done something about it. But for all those years that suffered, and you can imagine the pain and the, the frustration that they felt. I want you to try to, for a moment, imagine Mary, uh, Martha asking the question, Lord, why did you wait four days? We sent word to you that Lazarus was sick. 
And you know that we wouldn't send it to you unless it was serious. But Lord, you didn't come. And if you would have come, this would all be different. Lord, why didn't you come? Have you ever asked that question? Are you asking it today? Lord, why haven't you come? And Jesus said to her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection of the last day. But Jesus, I'm not interested in that. I wanted you four days ago. I know that in the end, we're all going to rise and there's hope. But I needed hope four days ago. I'm not looking for hope at the end of my life. I'm looking for it four days ago when my brother was so sick. Jesus, why didn't you come? And notice in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I want you to answer those four words, that question. Do you believe this? That Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in him, though they were dead, yet shall they live. Do you at the depths of your soul truly believe that? Martha runs home to get Mary. And we pick up in verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You think Mary and Martha had talked about this a lot? Because Martha by herself said the exact same thing to Jesus that Mary said to Jesus. And they had come to the conclusion together that if Jesus had just come, Lazarus would still be alive. In verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Jesus cares for you. I want you to hear that. Jesus really does care for you. And sometimes we mistake his silence for a lack of concern. But when Jesus saw Mary hurting, Jesus hurt with him. One of my kids recently shared that he was having some difficulty at school and he was sitting in my office and we were just talking about it and he started crying and was really upset about it, how difficult it was and some issues with some of the kids at school. And I'm telling you, man, like as he is sharing it, my heart is breaking for him. You know what I'm talking about, parents? Like, when your kid hurts, you feel physically sick. You feel ill inside, like you would do anything to make this right. And as Jesus is watching Mary not cry, but the Bible, the biblical word is to weep. It's to sob. It's, it's a point of despair of, of without control. She is weeping before the Lord and she's begging the Lord. If you had been here, Lazarus would still be alive. And the, and the implication is Jesus, if you had come, Jesus, why didn't you come when we cried out to you? But Jesus really does care for you, even when you don't understand your circumstances, even when you don't have good understanding of the pain and the trial and why you're suffering the way that you do. I want you to read verse 33 and I want you to feel it that as you weep, Jesus weeps with you. As you are hurting, Jesus hurts with you. In verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? And here's the invitation. And they said, Lord, come and see. Okay, Lord, we'll take you to the place where we laid him. But I don't want you to overthink that. It's not like Mary and Martha know or even have any idea what Jesus is gonna do because dead is dead, right? They know Lazarus is dead. He's been in the tomb four days. They knew that he had passed away. This time, the invitation, come and see, was an invitation to Jesus to come and see. I remember as a kid, my grandmother passing away. And what what I remember most as a kid is that my mom was gone for about a month. 
My grandmother lived up in East Texas about three hours away. And so my mom had received word from her mother that she had ovarian cancer and that it was stage four and they gave her just a few months, if not weeks to live. And so I just remember as a kid that we ate a lot of bologna sandwiches with my dad at home. And I remember that as a kid, like I want my mom back so I can have like something hot, you know? But she was gone all that time and as a kid I didn't really understand all of that but and death and, and my grandmother being sick and then I just remember going to the funeral and being so sad because I saw my parents so sad and we weren't super close to my grandmother but you know when your grandma passes it's still hard and every time we'd go up and visit my other grandparents who were still living we would stop by the Libby Cemetery and we go by the Libby Cemetery, it's just an old country church and a Libby community and they have a community cemetery and that's where my grandfather, who I never met, and my grandmother are buried. And I remembered that we would go and there was the mound of dirt over the grave and we would go there and we would clean all of that off and we would change out the flowers. But you're standing there and there's just, you're in a cemetery and you know that your grandmother is in the grave and you're just standing there and, and it's just, there's nothing but death around. Recently, I was pulling a glass out of, the, out of our pantry, and as I pulled it out, I, I got distracted and lost my grip on the glass, and it fell to the counter, and right, as it, right before it hit, I grabbed it with my hand, and the top of it hit the corner and just shattered glass everywhere all over the kitchen floor, and I was standing there with just a little piece left in my hand. Didn't cut me, thank the Lord. But I'm standing there with it, and there's glass all around, and I don't have any shoes on, and I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to move? I was stuck. Because anywhere I would move, there's glass, and so I'm trying to figure this out. Have you ever gotten to those points in your life where you feel like you're just standing among death, and you're just holding the broken pieces in your hand, and you're paralyzed? You can't move. You can't see the next day. You can't see the next moment. You do not know how you're going to be able to make it through. And sometimes when we're standing there and death has surrounded us and we're holding the pieces in our hand and we're paralyzed, those are the moments where we begin to question God and we begin to say to him, Lord, why didn't you answer my prayers? I prayed for that person. I prayed that you would heal them in a miraculous way. Lord, why didn't you come? And I want you to imagine that Mary and Martha, they take Jesus to the tomb of Lazarus. They're standing there and there's death and there's the pieces of their broken heart and they're weeping before the Lord. And then notice in verse 35, two words, the shortest verse in all of scripture, but one of the most profound, Jesus wept. He wept with them because he loved them and he was moved with compassion. I want you to hear something for a moment. In your heart, I want you to hear Jesus say, I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there. And then the next breath, I want you to hear him weeping for you. And those two sounds are not contradictory. They are the same loving God that is Lord over the good times and Lord over the bad ones. It's not that Jesus wants us to experience pain, but sometimes it is through pain that God does something miraculous and so powerful that it transforms us completely. I don't want my kids to suffer as a parent, I don't. But I know that sometimes my kids have to suffer. Sometimes I have to allow them to suffer for a greater good. Notice verse 38. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb and it was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes. And he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 
And I knew that, and I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I want you to try to imagine the magnitude of that moment. I want you to, in your mind, picture that cave in the side of a hill with a stone laid over it and that stone being rolled away. And I want you to listen to Martha plead logically and rationally with Jesus. Jesus, this is not a good idea. At this time, the body is decaying. There is nothing but death in there. What what are you doing, Jesus? It's already bad enough that you didn't come four days ago, but let's not, what are you doing? And I want you to imagine Jesus saying with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And from inside that tomb, you hear something move. And then you look into that door, into that dark doorway, and you see someone bound in cloths that were made for burying people shuffling his way out of that tomb. Can you imagine what that moment would have been like? Imagine the unbelief that you would have had. But imagine the sorrow, the deep, painful sorrow that had caused weeping for days to be turned into inexplicable joy. Imagine the unbelief turning to belief. I want you to hear Jesus say, Lazarus, come out. Broken marriage, come out. Depression, come out. Brokenness, come out. Emotional wounds, come out. Fear, come out. Addiction, come out. Death, come out. Dead bones, breathe and live again. Do you believe this? The same Jesus who called a dead man's body to breathe again is the same Lord of your life today. If he can make a dead man walk out of the tomb, I promise you that no matter what difficulty you may face, even if you don't understand it, and even if you've been crying out to Jesus for years, I want you to know that Jesus can bring life from death. Do you believe that? Just because Jesus hasn't come yet doesn't mean he can't. It just means that Jesus sees something greater. You see, when you invite Jesus to come and see, he brings life from death. That's exactly what happened in this story. Because it wasn't just Lazarus that came to life. Look down to verse 45. And many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, three words, believed in him. Go down to chapter 12 and verse 17, the verse that Charles read earlier. It's interesting because as Jesus enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, This crowd of people gather on the streets and they lay their coats and other gospels record that they wave palm branches as he came in. And they are crying out to him, Hosanna, which was a word of salvation. They were crying out to God for rescue and salvation. 
And the, the streets are lined with people worshiping him. And I want you to see why. I want you to see why Palm Sunday happened. Notice in chapter 12 and verse 17. And the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. They were telling everybody, listen, I stood right by that tomb and Jesus called a man out of that grave that had been dead four days. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw them unloose him. I saw his body restored. I saw him breathing and alive again, verse 18. And the reason why the crowd went out to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So Jesus, why didn't you come? He allowed the suffering for a season so that he might bring life from death and bring people to know him. So why hasn't Jesus answered your prayer yet? Why hasn't Jesus come? Could it be that God is waiting for that right moment and he's allowing you to suffer just for a season so that he can do something so amazing and so transformative with your life that not only you experience the life in Christ, but others will see it. And they'll see the life that he brought in you and it will change an entire city where lines of people will line up praising Jesus. Not because they personally saw the sign, because they also heard about it. So let me ask you this, do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus can call the dead back to life? Because it wasn't just Lazarus that came back to life, Jesus brought himself back to life after three days in the grave. Jesus is our hope. Jesus said he is the resurrection and the life. And that whoever believes in him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And that is a picture of our salvation. That's an invitation from Jesus to you. If you will come to him, you will find that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the only hope for our sin. He is the only hope that we have for a relationship with God. And that if we believe in him, we will not see death, but we will only have life. So Jesus invites us, come and see. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And as a child of God, maybe you've been praying for God to rescue you. And Jesus just hasn't come yet. I don't want you to mistake his silence or his delay for a lack of concern. Because when you invite Jesus to come and see, Jesus brings life from death. And in my own life, I can testify that it has not always been the way that I wanted it. If I had to draw it up, I wouldn't have lost my grandmother at such an early age. You know, if I had my way, I'd want her to live longer. But I'm not God. (laughs) But God has used that moment in my family's life and my mom and dad's life to increase their faith. And God used that moment in our lives where we could testify to other people about the salvation that Jesus brings. God used that moment of my grandmother's death, even though we pleaded with the Lord and we asked him, Lord, please spare her. Please let her live. God had other plans. But in that moment, do you know what happened? We were able to confirm through a conversation with my grandmother that she was, in fact, a believer in Jesus Christ. And that she had hope beyond beyond this life. And up to that point, we didn't know for sure. God sometimes does things in our lives and he allows them to happen and we don't understand it. And you may not in this lifetime (laughs) understand why it happens, but I want you to know that Jesus is moved by your hurt. Jesus weeps with you. And if you will simply come and see, if you will come and stand there, Jesus Christ can breathe life in the dead places. I hope that this is an encouragement to you today and that you in your heart will not stop inviting Jesus to the places of your hurt and say, Jesus, come and see. This is where death is right now for me. Jesus, I need your touch. I need you to call forth that which is dead and bring it to life. Do you believe it? 
If you believe it, don't stop asking Him. Don't stop crying out to Him because He hears and He knows and He loves and He is moved with compassion even in the midst of our hurt. Would you stand today with your heads bowed and with your eyes closed? I'm going to ask Charles if you wouldn't mind doing it and Jay if you wouldn't mind too just coming up here for a moment. If, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I've asked these men to just come up here for a moment. We're going to sing a song. We want to give you an opportunity to respond. So I want you to just in your own heart, take some time with the Lord. I know that some of you have been praying about the same issue over and over and over again. And I've asked these men to be here today. If any of you would like to pray with someone, they're here to pray with you. Maybe during this song, you'd like to just come up here and kneel down and come to the Lord again and ask him, Lord, come and see. I need you to come and speak life into this dead situation, into this part of my life. I need you to come. We want to give you that opportunity during this song to respond to whatever it is that God has spoken to your heart today. So these men are here to pray for you and to pray with you. Or if you'd like to come forward and just kneel and pray, we're going to make a commitment to each other with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. And we're going to make this commitment right now in our hearts that when we see someone come forward and pray, we are going to pray for them. We're not going to wonder. We're not going to ask questions. We're not going to try to be nosy. We're just going to pray for you. So if you need prayer today and you'd like to pray with Charles or Jay or grab the hand of a friend and come forward and pray, you can do that as well. But we want to give this time to the Lord so that we might respond to him. Father, we come to you in the powerful and the wonderful name of Jesus. And we know, God, what you can do. We know that you are able to bring life from death. We know that you are able to speak into the dead bones that are in the tomb today and bring them to life again. And I pray that it would be done today. Lord, for those who are struggling and those who are hurting, I pray that they would never give up hope, that they would not mistake silence or a delay by you to mean that you are indifferent to their hurting. We know, Lord, that you care for us. And we believe today that you are the resurrection and the life. So I pray today that you would speak to our hearts the things that we need to hear so that we can leave this place assured of our faith, that we can leave this place encouraged, that we can leave this place today with areas of our lives that were dead, now alive again. So we pray that you would speak to our hearts the things that we need to hear and move in this time. And we pray this to be done in Jesus' name. Amen.